those rich people always flying off somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Vegan Vanguard. A show about all things from the perspective of two revolutionary vegan women. I'm Maureen. And I'm Mexi. And today we're going to be talking about the law of attraction. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we should have thought about the title for this episode. Well, I think like more broadly, we're going to be talking about spirituality and anti-capitalism. But right. our inroads into this was, you know, the absurdity of the secret yes yeah i'm excited to have this conversation with you because i feel like you told me that there were some things about the secret that resonated with you well okay so here's the thing i haven't actually read the book or watched the the documentary mm -hmm. so i'm fully aware that when people think about the secret or i guess the people that the secret was marketed to are basically like well-off white suburban moms. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Not, I mean, I, yeah, maybe I shouldn't have said that. No, I, I think that you're right, but I also think there's this even more perverse phenomenon where the secret is addressing people who have been disenfranchised by neoliberalism and people who have been like laid off of their jobs or who have become sick or whatever, and mm -hmm. to basically tell them that they, you know, will feel re empowered when they change their thought patterns to will all of this money and health mm -hmm. and wealth and positivity into their life. Well, I don't know that, I mean, maybe you know more than I do because I, like, when The Secret came out, I just thought it was, you know, fluff that I would not be interested in. Um, and I say that as someone who considers themselves a very spiritual person, I just felt that. I don't know. It just looked, <laughs> I don't know, another word other than fluffy is just what mm -hmm. it appeared like to me. So I never got into it. I never paid attention to it. Um, but I'm wondering, like, is this something that's actually, like, do people actually try to get disadvantaged people on board with this? Or is this something that just resonates with a particular demographic, like a particular white yoga culture kind of demographic that doesn't immediately see structural constraints that are placed on the rest of society because they are not experiencing those structural constraints and so the law of attraction resonates with them because they just feel like you know if i want something enough then i will get it and like very possibly they will um you know is it more that it's just targeted to that audience because they don't have to think about structural oppression or is it that people are actually trying to market this to people who are disenfranchised in whatever way? I think that it is that it's trying to be market. It's an idea that is marketed to more disenfranchised people. I don't know if like the secret per se, but insofar as we're taking the secret sort of as like the poster child of positivity culture and like wellness culture, um, I do think that has bled into like corporate life and this idea that it's almost, you know, if, if you want a job, um, what's most valuable and about an employee is not his or her work. It's like his or her attitude. Um, mm. and the idea that, that these oppressions aren't structural. Um, mm. so I don't know. Does that answer your question? Um, kind of, but I, I guess I feel like there's a difference. I guess the way that I'm thinking about the law of attraction is like the idea that if you think long and hard enough about something or if you visualize yourself getting something enough, then you will get it. So like it's kind of a material thing or maybe it's a maybe it's a personal growth thing. If like if you visualize that enough, you will get it. Um I don't know. I think there's a difference between like the way that the way that you're told to just be positive at work or just like be a really good capitalist. Um, like obviously they're co-opting ideas of positivity or whatever, but I think there's a difference between that and then the idea of actually, you know, helping to retrain your thoughts for your own personal benefit, not for your employer's benefit. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I think, okay, I think first of all, why don't you explain 
what the law of attraction is, especially as someone who's like read the book and watched the movie. Um, because I think there's a lot going on with like different ideas of either spirituality or just positivity culture or this idea that you can just attract whatever. So yeah, maybe mm -hmm. we should just break down like, okay, what is the law of attraction? So the law of attraction in the way that I understand it is basically the idea that you can change the physical world around you with your thoughts that the physical world is just that like literally through spirit or mind energy you can exert this force that is going to attract certain things into your life and not others um and i actually i haven't read the book the secret i read the book the power which is a book that i read when i was um entering the vegan YouTube world for the first time and hearing a lot of people talk about it and recommending this book, The Power. And so I read that. Um, that's like a lot of people's Bible in this like positivity movement. And then I watched the, the, the secret, the movie, the secret, the movie is I almost, I wish you had watched it because it's literally like you see this guy dreaming of a car and the car shows up like in his driveway the next day. <laughs> or you see this one, like I distinctly remember this moment where this woman like really wants a diamond necklace oh and God. she's like lusting at it in a storefront lusting after it in a storefront and then you know a man shows up in her life and gives her that necklace or something like that yeah it's like really that kind of black and white um and there's also i mean an extension of the law of attraction and of just like positivity culture in general there's so many books about like how to get rich how to attract money into your life mm -hmm. by thinking positively about money there's literally uh, I wish I could remember the name of the book and we can write it in the show notes. Um, but I know that there's a dude that talks about reciting mantras of like, I love rich people every oh. morning to oh try and become that rich person. No. Um, and it, it is also, um, it talks about spending your money, basically living in abundance all the time and living as if you already have all this money that you're trying to attract into your life because mm -hmm by living this delusion of like pretending like you already have all these things into your life, the money is going to come. So a similar extension of that, although I think it's a little less harmful because it won't get you, you know, it won't get you totally bankrupt is if like you want a partner, um, you know, you can clear out a side of your wardrobe and pretend like it's like already waiting for the, the man that's or woman that's going to walk into your life and use that closet space or only sleeping on like one side of the bed, you know, writing lists, like constantly sort of fooling and retraining your thoughts to pretend like your dreams are already the reality. And if you do that long and hard enough, then that is what is going to happen. Wow. That... <laughs> <laughs> That's like, it's very upsetting to me that that is being put out there as a kind of spirituality because like that contradicts so many, you know, ancient or whatever spiritual beliefs that people hold. Um, I mean, like, I don't know if it's being put out there as a sort of spirituality. I don't though. know. I mean, it kind of seems like it. But I think you're getting at like precisely the crux of what it is and what it's not. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's not even spiritual because it's this ideology that's so fiercely individualistic mm -hmm. and really just about rewire you know about like materialism right. or about like uh, getting change mm -hmm. um yeah right which is the exact opposite of what like well it depends what kind of spiritual practice you're thinking about i'm obviously thinking about like buddhist ideas um but that's the complete opposite of what those teachings would tell you, you know what I mean? Mm. Um, like craving and materialism and greed and, you know, amassing things in this material world is not at all <laughs> the point of any kind of, um, I don't know, what I would call meaningful spirituality. But um, I was going to ask, have you seen The Bling Ring? I have not. Oh, it's so funny. So you should watch it. <laughs> Okay. It's um it's Emma Watson and um Leslie Mann. So Leslie Mann is the mom. Um and 
It's all about a, a group of teenagers who are like really well off and living in California and they break into celebrities houses and like take all their stuff or whatever when they're away at parties um and the mom is like her whole thing is that she teaches her children like she homeschools her kids and their religion is based on the secret like their religion is the secret <laughs> oh and God. yeah it's absolutely hilarious because it's like all of the stereotypes you could ever imagine about the secret coming true and um I don't want to give any spoilers, but basically it's like the kid who is like doing all this stealing and being put behind bars or whatever, um, basically just talks about how like, oh, I think I attracted this into my life to, for personal growth and like, yeah, it just, yeah, you have to watch it anyway. Yeah, that that's a huge <laughs> part of the secret or that, I don't even want to call it the secret because it's really not restrictive to like that particular book or movie, it really is, I think, like a much larger cultural phenomenon, mm -hmm. like spreading this positivity and, um, but of basically thinking about obstacles in your life, you know, if you get laid off, if you, you know, have, are diagnosed with a disease, if you, um, like really anything as a, a thing that you personally attracted into your life, but also a way to help you grow. So mm -hmm. I was watching a talk right before um right right before we started recording. A talk by Barbara Enrenrich. Wow, that is a very difficult uh, name to say. Um but she is a breast cancer survivor and she was ta she talks a lot about positivity culture and she was talking about how when she got diagnosed and when she was being treated for cancer, there was this like mandatory optimism that was basically required of her as a cancer patient. And I mean, she was talking also about the general like infantilization she felt with the whole pink ribbon movement, but she was also talking about how she was in certain support groups and um, they were like mandated to basically think about their illness as a personal growth experience and they had to stay positive about it because they it was very important to not like contaminate other people with like your negative thoughts and how there was this one particular patient who was like in stage four her or no her cancer had metastasized, metastasized um hope i'm saying that word correctly and she was basically like kicked out of the group because she would be a downer oh my god yeah. No, her talk is really great. And something else that she mentions, which is really interesting, is how positivity culture was such a big part of the financial meltdown in 2007 and 2008. Basically, that in finance, there is this constant positive outlook that you need to maintain all the time um, amongst the people in your office and amongst like, the, peop the people like on Wall Street. And how people who, you know, told Lehman Brothers that, you know, I don't think this is such a good idea or like this really seems like a housing bubble that we're building up. It doesn't, it doesn't seem like a very good idea to keep making stuff out of literally nothing <laughs> and how they were like fired um, mm -hmm. for not being more positive. So anyway, it's interesting. Uh, we'll link the talk down below. But so she talks about how, you know, it really does end up having an impact on like our material your, material world in neoliberalism to have this idea that like if you are positive and also I, I feel like the idea of infinite growth under capitalism is fueled by this too is like everyone can be an entrepreneur everyone it, we can just will all of this stuff into existence yeah absolutely or um we don't have to worry about environmental hazards or damage or consumption um that technology will find a way and that you know we'll be fine basically um yeah, I think that requires a huge, like a lot of cognitive dissonance or whatever. One of the first things that I think anyone hears when they learn about the law of attraction is like, okay, well, what about, you know, people who don't have enough food and people who are like living in countries where they're dying of poverty? Um, mm -hmm. Because that's like a very obvious thing to wonder. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And, you know, you're wondering like okay well is it just that they don't want water badly enough or food yeah. badly enough to just attract it into their lives like it seems very mm -hmm. odd that anyone would die from mm -hmm. not having enough food if really they could just 
Think about it. Manifest. And actually, the author of The Secret said this is another thing I got from the talk that I was mentioning before said that um, the tsunami in 2007. So I'm not exactly sure which tsunami she's talking about, but she was basically just saying that they had like a tsunami, they were attracting tsunami thoughts. What? Yeah. Isn't that like the most fucking cruel thing? That is you could possibly say. It was actually disgusting. Yeah. Like as if people were sitting there imagining a tsunami and like yeah, trying just, to like manifest. a typical Sunday, <laughs> like just thinking about tsunamis. There was like a critical mass of people thinking about tsunamis <laughs> yeah. to the point yeah. that it came at them. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so she says, so a, lo- a lot of times in positivity culture, the people, you know, who are starving and who are hungry, it, a big part of the law of attraction is also just learning to be grateful all the time. So being like, you know, even just the fact that like I can get on my computer, even just the fact that I have electricity and heating, like I'm part of the 0.0001%. Like I'm so lucky. And that is, you know, obviously we are extremely lucky, but you're supposed to use that like grateful mentality to help attract abundance into your life. And so to think about the misery that goes on in the world, like basically just as an impetus to be more grateful for what you do have. Mm-hmm. Um, I bear with me because these are just thoughts that I've had. Like this is not actually said in that way or anything. But so you know, when you ask someone who subscribes to the law of attraction, like, what about those people who are starving? Like, a lot of times they'll just bring it back to you and just tell you, like, you know, that's even a bigger reason to be grateful. But I feel like that's like such a gross instrumentalization of poverty to just think about people who are more disenfranchised than you, not as a reason why you should be more compassionate and you should actually, you you have like a greater duty to give back and to organize and to help overcome structural oppression. Instead, just like use it as a way to personally fulfill and enrich your life and attract more abundance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, There's like, there's a lot going on here. Um, I think... I think with like any kind of, I guess, quote unquote, positive or like, quote unquote, spiritual ideal, there are different ways to read it. Um, So I think there's obviously like a more productive way to read some of these larger concepts like positivity, like gratitude, like whatever. Um, But obviously, as you're saying it's been completely co-opted by this capitalist framework that we're living under, um, like incredibly individualized um, and making people more docile or more accepting of, you know, the structural violence that is happening all around them. Um, And yeah, there's, there's obviously a real neoliberal focus on the individual that whatever whatever you do is kind of your own fault if you fail or succeed in this capitalist system it's your own fault um and you know whatever is happening you should just be individually grateful and not perhaps consider yourself as part of a collective that would like necessitate you morally and politically to get out there and actually fight for the collective you know mhm i agree I was listening to the uh, Vegan Warrior Princesses Attack podcast, actually, um, the other day about positivity culture, and they were talking about, yeah, specifically how this manifests in the workplace, um, about, you know, the people at the top making these terrible decisions and then... um, you know, just kind of saying, well, change happens, change happens all the time, change is a part of life. And if you're, if you're like not adapting to change, if you're not open to new directions, then, you know, you're just not in the right framework and you can leave if you want, you know what I mean? You can just go somewhere else, which of course is ludicrous in this political economic framework. People cannot just go get whatever the the hell job that they want, especially if they are coming from a poor background, they don't have the education or training. Um, And also because there's no work because robots are taking over everything and um, capitalism produces unemployment. (laughs) Yep. And like two people have all the wealth at this point. Right. Yeah. And um, yeah, 
plugging my precarious work video, but capitalism makes work more and more precarious and flexible and like contract, like contract instead of full employment with benefits, etc. Um, so yeah, I think I think the the way of reading it as something that is very individual and very material focus um, is obviously something that is in service of oppressive systems. Like it's obviously something that is actually in service of your own disenfranchisement, unless you are one of the few who is lucky enough not to be disenfranchised. Yeah, I absolutely agree with what you're saying. And I'm actually really excited to have this conversation with you because I've had a very hard time in like my own life or like my own mind, um, reconciling the fact that I, I wouldn't call myself an atheist. I, I am somewhat spiritual. Um, it's funny because I, I, I feel like I'm almost holding off until another part of my life to explore that more, but I know that it's there and I want to keep it there. Mm -hmm. And it's something that is still like important to me and that I'm very interested in. Mm -hmm. I've been watching a lot of Russell Brand lately. Actually, not lately. I have fucking <laughs> watched everything that man has done for the past four years. Mm -hmm. um, I really, really love his work. And I just like love the way that he talks about these concepts. Like I love the way he talks about capitalism. But I also really love a, a huge part of his platform is talking about spiritual, about spiritual spirituality and like meditation and the fact that we are all one and the fact that there's this like infinite consciousness that you know we have these five senses that keep us sort of bound to the material world and that we're only experiencing like one part of reality on in this like terrestrial like carnal existence that we are you know currently living out mm -hmm. but that there's actually like an infinite space and realm for connection and anyway all of these ideas and i hate crediting a white man for them because i know that they have you know mm -hmm. those are those are like buddhist for, ideas yeah an extremely long time and he absolutely like he he credits them too like he doesn't mm -hmm. you know i'm not saying he's perfect i'm just saying that i love him <laughs> um, but um yeah he definitely doesn't like pretend to have come up with all this stuff on his own or anything obviously even but i'm sort of crediting him for like i don't know bringing them into my life well, whatever. I feel like that is a, a huge part of his platform is just talking about these ideas in like more accessible terms so that people can get down. Um, and he talks a lot about the importance of spirituality to in like activism or how he feels that there should be like a greater, bigger vig vision of like connectedness and a bigger consciousness of oneness. Mm -hmm. And that idea has like really spoken to me. But then, you know, I have this whole other part of me that thinks you know, separate from that, you know, that the law of attraction is like super fucked up and like has coerced the way that people think. And um, anyway, everything that I said in the first half of this podcast. So I'm actually really excited to ask you how you reconcile your Buddhism because you identify as a Buddhist with like your anti-capitalist beliefs. And I feel like you've perhaps like thought about this more than I have and so mm -hmm. could give me like cool answers. Yeah, I'm actually so excited to talk about this. This has been a common question. I mean, I used to have Curious Cat. I deleted it because I was just, I didn't have time for it. But yeah, many of the questions were about that. And I, I used to have some spiritual videos on my channel. Um, and I had a few people go and watch those, like after I changed my channel to like a really anti-capitalist channel obviously um i had a few people watch those and be like wow that was super reactionary and i was like if you read it that way but it's not like i feel like people are kind of missing the mark when they just really oversimplify it and then just write it off as something that mm -hmm. is definitely just serving capital um because yeah. i think it can serve so much more than that um so i haven't watched like what russell brand has said about it i think he's funny but <laughs> okay. I, I, I i'm pretty I sure <laughs> you can get all these ideas from 
from other places. <laughs> yeah, I think he's hilarious, but I haven't watched like much of what he said. But um, yeah. So yeah, so I'm I sure we're gonna get to... a few comments <clears throat> talking about how he's problematic and some of his like a lot of his past oh, yeah. is really problematic. But like he's trying hard, guys. <laughs> Don't be mean to Russell. <laughs> I mean, everyone's problematic. So yeah, I'm sure you're definitely going to get some yeah, exactly. comments about how he's just a capitalist and whatever. Oh, he's um, definitely not. Right. Anyway. But I see what you're saying. <laughs> I'm like so defensive. It's ridiculous. Anyway. Um, so yeah, I really came into Buddhist philosophy when I was in my early 20s. Um, I guess I'll just open up and tell all the listeners that like I've had... issues with depression i will say since a very early age um and like suicidal thoughts since a very early age um and a lot was going on for me at that time um i yeah i didn't really know what i was doing with my life i had this like really tumultuous and unhealthy very unhealthy relationship that had just ended and like i was just yeah, I had no self-esteem. Um, I had no positivity. I was like stuck in just feelings of anger, jealousy, um, really feeling absolutely worthless to the point that I no longer wanted to live. Um, I, yeah, and I, I it's also um, the way that I felt just you know, having, learning everything that I was learning, having all of this knowledge and then just kind of, um, I mean, I, even from a very early age, I really kind of saw through like what the society was. And I always just really was just like, why the fuck are we doing this? Even when I was a small child, I was like, why are we organizing our world this way? This is really fucked up. And I always kind of felt like just this feeling of like hopelessness, um, in the face of these like broader structures. Um, so anyway, I was traveling a lot cause I was trying to figure out where to do my masters. I was looking for like different field sites that I could go. Um, so I was in India and Indonesia and Thailand and I started to really read Buddhist philosophy. Um, and it just resonated so much with me. Like it just really like shook my whole way of viewing the world and reality and myself and my emotions and, um, my actions and yeah, really everything. Um, and the thing about like Buddhist philosophy is that it's, it's the opposite of individualism. Like it's, uh, like people are really like, oh, well, that's just, you know, you're just meditating for yourself. And it's like, but you're doing this with the goal to help others. Like the whole thing is about how like generosity and selflessness and whatever is, that's the route to real happiness. Whereas like wanting, craving, desiring, like ego, I, and mine, like these are all things that ultimately bring suffering and that are fueled by like various delusions that we have in this society. Um, like delusions like greed, anger, selfishness, um, jealousy, all these other problematic emotions that kind of keep us locked in these patterns and keep us behaving in certain ways that not only hurt ourselves but hurt others. Um, so all of this just resonated so much with me. And like the deeper I got into it, like the deeper you get into it, it talks actually about like the nature of reality itself. Um, and kind of like as you were talking about, like that everything is intimately connected um and that like ultimately everything is just this like i don't want to say empty void but like voidness is a really big theme where it's like basically because you will die one day it's like all of this like all of this material stuff is not really real like even this mm. wine glass i'm drinking wine <laughs> at 11 30 what time is it Maxi? <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's happy hour somewhere um but even this wine glass is like if you try to break it down to its smallest parts like it's just these atoms and then even when you break down those atoms it's all just neutrinos and whatever so it's just like none of this is ultimately real um and even like ourselves, like even our bodies, like none of this, like we're not inherently here. Like we're all just connected to mm -hmm. this like very bigger thing. Um, 
so yeah so that's like one way to just um like all of these things like all of these ways of thinking are ways to um get ourselves out of the negative delusions that we're in under this especially capitalist system so to get out of these ideas that like we need a fancy car and a great house and we need like even with things like we need a husband and kids and everything like even all these things that we just compare ourselves to everyone else and it's about like actually like seeing through all of that and seeing that like selflessness is the way to be and um yeah i have so, a question yes yeah. maybe i'm getting i'm trying to think about how everything that you're saying is fundamentally different from the law of attraction and how the law of attraction which it completely is but how I almost feel like w what you're speaking about is the fact that, you know, we're these like blobs of atoms that don't really like we experience like actually reality and consciousness is, is infinite. And we only we're only temporarily here to experience it in this very particular and limited way. And we should, I guess, like meditate or develop like a higher uh, a spiritual practice to help to help the world, right? Is that what you're saying? Mm -hmm. um, or at least to try and access this, uh, this truth about life that actually like our human material embodiment of it is like an infinitely small part of what exists. And I feel like the law of attraction is different than that in, in so far as it's actually saying that the way that you experience life from your own distinct pos positionality is like extremely is like fundamentally all that matters and that you can attract or you can like rearrange life like as if like life and nature and whatever is actually like there to serve you or mm -hmm. something that you can have an impact on whereas i feel like you're saying that buddhism is saying that fun like you don't really have an impact or like even the the, the you the individual person is not Mm -hmm. yeah not important or doesn't exist right so i mean it's not supposed to be like you don't exist and you're not important but it's supposed to be like, like do i not exist <laughs> <laughs> um but it's supposed it is supposed to be like bettering yourself to help others um and so for many people the goal of their practice is to become like bodhisattva or whatever so to become like a enlightened entity so that you can help others to reach that state too so like so that you can help others to get out of their um you know clouded visions of like greed or anger or jealousy or whatever um so you can help them find happiness and also um yeah just improve the world around you so it's not it's not supposed to be like you just do nothing because nothing matters um although i i suppose it could be read that way <laughs> But like, mm -hmm. that's not really the point of it. Um, but yeah, the major difference is that like, I mean, um, in like Buddhist philosophy, the idea of like wanting and desiring and craving, especially desiring material wealth. I mean, of course, I've talked about this before, but this is all assuming that you have your basic needs met. So you have food, you have shelter, you're fine. So like myself here, like I'm fine. Um, so the idea of me like craving like a bigger house and like more money and more stuff and like more fancy clothes and whatever like that is considered to be a form of deluded suffering that actually just leaves you unsatisfied because it's not like you're craving things that themselves are not real like you can't take this material stuff with you to the next life you're just gone um and so this stuff is gone you know what i mean so craving that stuff is just is a delusion because it's like these things like you're craving all these things that don't matter um but it's it's leaving you unsatisfied it's like leaving you in a constant state of want um versus like a state of just like serene like okay like i have what i need to have so let's focus on others like let's focus on bringing everything to others um whereas obviously the law of attraction is about wanting it's about desiring things and like material things so it's like that's completely at odds with any kind of 
you know what I mean? Is because it's just like <laughs> a Buddhist would say that people who are in that state, like wanting, like, oh, I want more money, I want this. Um, I mean, but then again, you have to think about like, okay, well, someone who is on the street without money, of course they want money, right? So it's like for that person, yeah, but for somebody else who already has their baseline needs met, um, sitting around like desiring material wealth and things like that is just considered like greed and desire and all these problematic things that are actually forms of like delusion and suffering. Mm -hmm. I have two things to answer to, or like two thoughts that are floating around my head. The first is that what you're saying about wanting or about being in a state of want is actually uh, very extensively spoken about in what, in like the secret and the law of attraction. And that's why like your whole your whole basic mentality before you start to desire things is to be really grateful for what you have and pretend that you're living in abundance and that you already have, you know, not even just pretend, but really tell yourself like, I'm so grateful everything I have. And I, I don't, I'm satisfied. And that basically, but see, then there's a contradiction for me. I'm seeing mm -hmm. your face. Yeah. You're confused. And I'm confused too, <laughs> because, because I agree that it's like great, but but I feel like if being really grateful, if the way that they're, they're framing the need for you to be grateful on an individualistic level is sacrificing your ability to have compassion for others and even going so far as to sort of appropriate their suffering for your own personal experiment of being really grateful all the time, mm -hmm. it, it seems gross. Mm -hmm. And what was my second point? Well, like, it seems like ultimately the point of that gratitude, though, is to attract more wealth into your life, which is extremely yeah. contradictory to the point of being satisfied. I know, man. I've been confused about that. I mean, I don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and then my second, my when you were talking about reconnecting to higher consciousness to stop desiring things all the time or to stop wanting things all the time. I wonder what the difference is between doing that through like a Buddhist framework or a spiritual awareness and like how actually it, you know, how anyone who's atheist or anyone who doesn't like believe in, in that in particular can talk about like deprogramming yourself from neoliberalism or deprogramming mm -hmm. yourself from all these things that we've been taught to want that we don't actually, mm -hmm. that we don't actually need or want. Um, so I guess, <laughs> My very long-winded question is, why do you find the framework of spirituality helpful to you and to your activism and to your like anti-capitalist struggle? Mm, I'm glad you asked because this is going to be kind of a long answer. Um, but I feel like the reason that Buddhist philosophy really um, resonated with me – and by the way, this is the same thing – like. <sighs> People talk a lot about, you know, being a Marxist and then it's just like assumed that you are 100% on board with every single thing that Marx wrote. And if he wrote something that you disagree with, then you just think Marx is wrong and you're not a real Marxist. You know what I mean? It's just like, no, mm -hmm. all of these things are analytical tools. They're all tools for understanding the world around us, for understanding different processes. So... Yeah, like obviously the fundamentals of like Marxist critique of capitalism resonate very well with what's going on in the world, but it's like you don't have to take literally every word. Um, it's the same thing with Buddhist philosophy. It's like there's a there's a many different sects of Buddhist philosophy. It's not like I'm taking like every single thing at its word or like that every single thing resonates with me. Um, mm -hmm. But so much of it does resonate with me. Um, and part of that is because it's kind of like the non-religion. Um, and I say that because it's like, it's not about believing in like a supreme deity. And in fact, it actually kind of criticizes, um, like many Buddhists will criticize well, not criticize, but like there's the idea that a lot of those religions that are based on like a creation story and like an ultimate deity, that these are actually, these are things that were created out of fear. And fear is one of like the core delusions um, that, you know, Buddhists seek to overcome. Um, so like the idea is that like, you know, we just feared 
what is this world about? What happens when we die? And so these stories were created about this like ultimate deity that will save us. Even if we sin, we can just repent. And that that's ultimately just about like fear and insecurity. Um, mm-hmm. But that Buddhists would say like, no, we don't want any part of that. We want, we want to overcome those insecurities and fears and whatever. And we don't need to be praying to like some ultimate power. Um, so that's why I really liked it because it's not about that. It's about like personal growth for the good of the whole, um, like for the good of like the most people. Um, but yeah, so, sorry, what was I going to talk about? (laughs) Um, I was asking you why that resonates with you more, or at least in a different, mm, on a different level than would just like learning about why capitalism is so fucked up. Um, right. So, um, like, I feel like for atheists who do kind of embark on this path of like retraining their mind, they are using like Buddhist techniques and Buddhist philosophies. They're just not calling it that. Um, and like, maybe it like, maybe it's because I came into it first through reading Buddhist philosophies. And then now like, here I am. Um, but like for atheists who don't believe in God, I don't see why they wouldn't be into these kinds of spiritual philosophies because it seems to be consistent with a lot of things that they, um, well, not, I can't speak for all atheists, but like atheists who are Mm -hmm. like anti-capitalist and atheists who are like trying to promote social justice, et cetera. Um, yeah, I mean, it seems like things are very similar, but I guess I just, like coming from that place, um, like where I was in my early twenties, like this just really, um, resonated with me. And then it's really helped me to do all of that work to like unpack, um, capitalism. And it's really helped me in my activism in the sense that, um, like, first of all, I think just the idea of selflessness and generosity as a route to happiness, um, instead of like, greed or like you know oppression or violence or like stepping stepping on other people to get ahead for yourself Mm -hmm. um i think like just these ideas really resonate with the ideas of like redistribution of wealth and um like helping marginalized communities and etc so i don't think that that's like terribly at odds um with what i'm working towards and then just on like a personal level like like just anecdotally like even when i first started my youtube channel or like when i would post like i would post all these political things on facebook or whatever and i would get these horrible horrible reactionary comments and i would just get so angry and just so like i would just spend all my energy like clapping back at this person and like just checking and checking and refreshing refreshing to see what comments they had left next and just expended every like i just really took things personally um and really felt like i would just be swarmed with like self-doubt like do i actually know what i'm talking about am i the person that can actually speak about this and um it really like hindered my activism it hindered me actually feeling confident enough to have a voice and to say anything um and it really kind of made it about me and about my feelings of being like angry or hurt or pissed off or attacked or whatever um but these kinds of philosophies really helped me to be like, you know what, this is nothing to do with me. Like if people are making shitty videos about me, if they're leaving shitty comments and <laughs> do they? <laughs> yeah, do they? If people are doing all this stuff like they're so insightful. Yeah. Like, you know, it's not about me. It's about something much bigger than myself. And um, all of these problematic emotions like anger, jealousy, delusion, like these are all delusions that I'm able to overcome, like really focusing on these kinds of philosophies. And then just like, so all I do know is just put out my content and if people are liking it, great. And if they're not, then also great. But like, I'm, I'm not doing this for myself, you know what I mean? And like, I'm just a lot more in control of my emotions and my own state of being. And I feel like I'm able to expend so much less energy fighting people. Like Mm -hmm. that energy that I used to spend fighting and being like kept up all night, just like anxious and pissed off. um, I'm spending that energy now in just, just making more content and spreading information that I think is valuable and 
trying to do that from a place of like love and compassion as opposed to like anger. And I just feel like that's more effective for me. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that was useful. I, I still have this weird, like, I guess it's because I hate the law of attraction so much. And that's where I've unfortunately learned about a lot of these ideas that sometimes that I wonder like, well, is that ultimately still saying that is it still victim blaming in a way because you're saying that people, not you, but like, you know, this line of thought can lead to a place where you're actually blaming someone's like thought pattern or have, telling that person that maybe what should change is like how they react to the situation. And while that's like useful, sometimes I also see how like that can lead down a very, mm -hmm. I don't know, something about like structural oppression and spirituality. I've still, I still haven't fully understood how to completely fit those two pieces together and have them like coexist in my mind in a way that doesn't make me uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, like, I guess for me, I'm like, it, again, it's how you read it. Like if you want to read it as something yeah. that's victim blaming, then whatever. But if you want to actually make your own practice about something more positive, like, I mean, the core tenet of like Buddhist philosophy is compassion. Um, so like having compassion for marginalized people's to me, it means fighting for them. It means, of course, mm -hmm. of course, being angry about their injustice. And of course, doing like, I have a position of privilege. I have my baseline needs met. I don't need to spend my energy craving more things. I can spend my energy having compassion and then working towards what will be the best for others, like being selfless, being generous. Like, so it's, it's, it's how you read it. So like, of course, if you're going to read it as like, Oh, that's so fucking reactionary, then fine. But if you're going to actually like delve into the philosophy and take from it, what you can, that's what I mean about like, all of these things are just analytical tools. Like all of these things are just things that you can use personally to enhance yourself and to enhance the way that you understand the world and the way that you do your praxis in it like if you're gonna take it as like mm -hmm. well fuck that then fuck it fine um but i personally think that these things are really useful and they're really like a lot of the things that i kind of came to realize in studying this kind of philosophy were that a lot of the ways that we're taught to think and react and whatever in this society are actually really problematic and that actually, you know, forgiveness and love and compassion are the things that take real courage and like, you know, just shutting down and like hating someone um, if they wronged you or something is like, obviously it's cathartic and obviously in a lot of situations that it is, you know, valid, um, but that ultimately like, that's it's gonna ultimately hurt yourself um just just certain ways of like reacting or thinking about things are going to actually harm yourself more than you realize um i don't know it's kind of hard to explain but i again like it can be read in a in a productive way or a non-productive way and i just kind of i choose to take from it what i think is really valuable and mm -hmm. I think it's, I think it's valuable for anyone to actually like look into this kind of stuff. Cause like, mm -hmm. I, I remember when like you first were asking me about like Buddhist stuff and you mentioned the law of attraction and I was like, that has nothing to do with my practice. <laughs> like that has mm -hmm. absolutely nothing to do with like how I think or, or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, like recently I've even been like just uncomfortable in even saying like, I don't even, I took it off my Twitter that I call myself a Buddhist because I'm like, really, I'm not like, I'm not out there going to temple or like whatever. But I mean, the, the, the thing about Buddhist philosophy is that like, you know, it's just, it's just something, it's a tool. It's a tool for you to like work with and practice with. And if things don't resonate, then they don't. And if they do, then they do. But like, it's not like I'm, you know part of like a sect and I actually go to temple and do anything um yeah I I mean I don't think temple is bad I know that that's not what you're saying but. no I'm not saying it's bad I'm just saying that like yeah I just kind of am uncomfortable even saying that like oh I'm Buddhist like really it's just like I just resonate with a lot of the philosophy and it's it's really helped me in my life and I think mm -hmm. I think that people should actually look into it um mm -hmm. yeah yeah 
it's for me like on a non on just like an instinctive level this uh i guess it's it's when i think about everything that i know about the state of the world and the state of like all you know the oppressed like people and animals that are being just killed every day and are living in terrible situations that then i I start to sort of distance myself from it or start to be like, well, I don't really like care to learn about this stuff or I don't, I don't know. Like, I, I wouldn't say that I don't care to learn about it, but that, where it like kind of conflicts in my mind, but then on a very, on a more instinctive level, I'm very like fascinated mm-hmm. by it. And I also, I like this idea of things being like eternal or of, of all of us being connected to each other and everything being like one. And mm-hmm. the, this idea that like my life is actually just this, particular incarnation that is so so temporary you know like Mm -hmm. um and in my activism I think just like fighting for I don't know just like the the just knowing that there is something bigger out there knowing that also Mm -hmm. um I'll plug another um Russell Brand reference but he recently (laughs) on his podcast had um the scientist Rupert Sheldrake talk um, I don't know if you've ever heard about him, mm-hmm. but he talks about um, – he's, you know, like a scientist. He went to, like, Harvard and Oxford and all this, like, impressive stuff. But um, – and he talks about, like, basically the whole, like, a lot of the science community has really just, like, shut him out now. Um, and he's considered the most um, controversial scientist in the world. But he has all – he has done all of these experiments on the fact that uh, – on this idea of morphic resonance and – that there's actual that that everything in nature has a memory and so that you know trees communicate with each other and animals communicate with each other and there are actually experiments that show that if rats in a certain part of the world learn to do something over time like rats in a completely different part of the world will also get better at doing that one thing Mm -hmm. um there's like a eternal like consciousness and like memory that we Mm -hmm. all actually have access to Mm -hmm. Um, he was saying, you know, when I discovered all this stuff, when I realized this made sense for how like leaves learn to grow and how, you know, like nature works in all these cool ways. And I decided to really study it. And I went to India, like a bunch of, um, scientists there were like, oh yeah, like, mm-hmm. like, dude, like everyone knows this here, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and how, yeah, obviously these are ideas that are talked about, um, in just a lot of other places. Yeah. Yeah, um, well, in terms of, like, all the shit that's happening in the world right now, um, like, a lot of, kind of, like, the Buddhist idea is that, like, um, like, obviously structures are driving this, but even, like, structures, even, like, capitalism, I mean, as Marx would say, capitalism is just a set of social relations, and social relations are enacted by people, um, Mm -hmm. and so, like, they, like, a lot of the Buddhist idea is that, like, a lot of the shit that is, happening in this world is driven by these delusions like greed like materialism like you know all these things that are actually forms of suffering and that inflict suffering on others and then inflict suffering on ourselves and so the idea is that if every person were to become this like enlightened selfless understanding generous compassionate being um then like can you imagine what kind of social structures we would actually form together you know what i mean Mm -hmm. so like if everyone could actually be mindful of the things that are driving their wants and desires and driving you know their ambitions like i'm thinking of a lot of people that i know that i won't (laughs) i'm thinking of some people that i know that i won't (laughs) name um whose ambitions are really to become as quote unquote successful as possible meaning Mm -hmm get the biggest paycheck that they can possibly get and have all the security and have a cottage and have this right um if people were mindful of those kinds of things and saw them as delusions and saw them as problematic imagine like if everyone actually did that imagine the kinds of like new social social structures and networks and everything that we would be forming um so the idea Mm -hmm. is like 
not only to just do this individually, but to try and inspire others to do the same kind of like mindfulness work um, mm -hmm. in order to try and inspire like a different kind of world. Obviously, that's not in itself going to bring down these structures, but like having that different outlook and that different understanding of reality, I think is important for everyone, not for everyone, but like for people who want to do this practice and inspire others to do this practice as well. Um, and then sorry go ahead yeah i love the idea of of like spirituality being a driver for social change mm -hmm. like obviously on its own like me sitting here being a wonderful compassionate person on its own is not going to like i still have to get out there and protest and fight and do my right. activism like the reality is not literally going to change just because you're thinking about it in a certain way right and i think that's like what fundamentally is different about mm -hmm. Right. I don't know. Yeah, exactly. But thinking about this in this different way is still important because if we're like, if we're doing all of this activism, but we're not mindful of the fact that maybe our wants and desires are influenced by a broader society that is leading us into these problematic patterns and this framework that just supports the status quo and capitalism, if we're not mindful of that and if we're not actively you know, checking ourselves and thinking deeply about like our emotions, our thoughts, our personal reality, like then the kinds of social structures that we're going to replicate might not necessarily look that different if we're still being driven by things like ego and jealousy mm -hmm. and greed and whatever. Right. So mm -hmm. anyway, um, yeah. So like in the, in the show notes, I will link some resources. The thing is that like a lot of what I read that first inspired me, like I was reading like from specific monks and stuff, like I would buy them at local monasteries and things when I was in Thailand or um, like in India or whatever. So I don't think these things are readily available, but I will mm. link some resources of like intro to Buddhist thought. Um, maybe things that I haven't necessarily read, but the things that are like commonly encouraged for people to read. Um, just so, yeah, you can like kind of get a taste for like what this all about, what this is all about. Um, and again, like you can read it whatever way you want. You can read it, you can read it in a reactionary, like individualist way. You can read it in a way that like might be really helpful for you. And just for me, like for my emotional well being and my mental well being, it's really made a lot of difference mm -hmm. um for someone who has been like chronically depressed for so long um it really has made a difference in how i handle just everyday stresses and how i handle like relationships and my own practice and everything um great i mean there are obviously people who are going to be like but buddhists are you know massacring people in burma or like buddhists are doing this right and it's just like yeah well christians are doing that too like everyone's doing fucking shit that it, like it really doesn't have to do with the actual philosophy like that's just a military dictatorship like horrible reactionary thing you know what i mean like i obviously can't excuse what particular people who are calling themselves buddhists are doing um but you know that's kind of mm -hmm. they're obviously not following the philosophies very well if they're <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah yeah i mean it's yeah. that's it's interesting because buddhist buddhism is not considered an organized religion right because like i mean that's definitely the case for all organized religions it's like none of them fucking actually practice what they preach mm -hmm. well i feel like it it is kind of organized in certain states like for example like like the national religion of thailand is buddhism like the the official religion of burma is buddhism um so yeah so i feel like when you get to that point it's kind of just like you're just calling yourself that mm -hmm. and it's not necessarily that you're practicing it <laughs> yeah it's like buddhist washing yeah <laughs> that was a joke but <laughs> But it is. <laughs> but maybe it's offensive. I don't know. Um, yeah. Cool. Well, I really loved this conversation. Yeah, me too. That was kind of good to like get off my chest just because 
I get so many questions about how do you uh, reconcile this? Well, I think people will also ask me like, well, how do you reconcile? Because like people are talking about like revolution. It's like, well, aren't Buddhists nonviolent? And I'm like, well, I've never really said I was for like a super violent revolution. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm, interesting. Do you not <laughs> yeah. feel like violence has its place in revolution? So I've talked about this very briefly. Um, mostly I was just kind of echoing what the vegan warrior princesses attack um, people, <laughs> Nicole and Callie, mm -hmm. had said basically that like for people who are experiencing, it's like what kind of violence are we talking about, right? Because it's like there's that quote from Angela Davis where it's like you mm -hmm. ask me if I'm okay with violence, like do you right. know do you know what's going on to the black community right now? Um, so it's like, you know, I, like I'm very much upset by the structural violence that's going on. I'm not particularly upset if like Black Lives Matter organizes and then like breaks a window of a Starbucks or something. Like fuck, fuck that. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Right. Um, but I feel like this probably is the topic for a whole other podcast mm -hmm. about what I think about um, like how we're going to make change right now. But I think there's a difference between like if you have a critical mass of people that believes that we need like very radical change to our social structures and if that critical mass is standing up and saying no we want change and then mm -hmm. um you know the state is coming in with their tanks and shit and trying to like fuck people up like there's a difference between defending your position and then just like outright actually wanting violence um mm -hmm. and i've talked about this before where it's like i feel like you may encounter violence if you're if you're standing up for your position um you may encounter violence that you might have to respond to but i like i'm not a person who would be like yeah let's like go fuck everything up you know what i mean mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah it's interesting because i feel like you've made videos on spirituality or you've labeled yourself a buddhist so people like ask you how you reconcile that with anti-capitalism but i made two videos one was old and like not that good so i don't recommend it but the other one is called what what is it like law of attraction is it a capitalist hoax or something like that um and i i feel like a lot of my viewers think i definitely am not spiritual or i got a lot of comments on that video asking like well where you know because I think a lot of people do ask themselves that question when they have like this anti-capitalist consciousness and you know an awareness of how wellness culture is so so destructive and like perverse of like okay well where do I draw the line then or like how do I reconcile that knowledge with this like maybe core belief of mine that I can't really put words to that I do think that there might be a bigger you know unity or something mm -hmm. um so yeah i don't know where i wanted to go with that but just yeah i mean i think for every person you just have to have a lot of you have to have nuance with it like if you're you know what i mean if you're at work and someone's telling you to be positive because they're like stripping away all your benefits but you should just be grateful that you have a job i mean that's that's very manipulative on the other person's part. They're not, they're not acting mm -hmm. with compassion. They're not acting with selflessness. They're acting in a selfish nature. And so you can recognize that that person is, re is acting in a selfish nature, which is like a delusion. So like that, per you know what I mean? Like this is not mm -hmm. an okay situation. Mm -hmm. um, but then you can also understand when in your own life, these ideas are actually fruitful and important, you know? Yeah. I think part of my resistance too to it comes from the fact that like I was deep into the law of attraction for a little while. I mean, this only lasted like two months or something, but it is like, because the thing is like, you have to believe in it a hundred percent. Otherwise you're told that it won't work. So it's like, you have to be super uncritical of it. And you also, then anytime you start to be a little bit like ask questions that are sort of forbidden to be asking yourself then you're like well is this why the law of attraction is not working is this why i haven't mm. attracted this yet into my life you know mm -hmm. so um and i think that at that point at the, during that part of my life it was sort of during my whole just like you know i've talked about this on my channel just like like vegan happy hippy dippy everyone creates their own reality stage um and i don't think i i do think it fundamentally like now being on the other side and thinking back to how i started thinking about like other disenfranchised people i do think that it 
like altered my worldview. I do think mm-hmm. a part of a part of you, if you believe in the law of attraction very strongly and into your ability to will these things into your life, has to think that people who haven't brought abundance into their life are partly responsible for it or that mm-hmm. there's something that they're not quite doing right. And like mm-hmm. that really scares me. Mm-hmm. It sounds to me like the law of attraction is this extreme perversion. It like, like sucks. Like an extreme reactionary perversion of what would otherwise be okay ideas into like, <laughs> yeah. It actually <laughs> just sounds like a really dangerous ideology um, yeah. in, in my view. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Okay, so we have a few new patrons to shout out. So thank you so much for your very generous pledges. Um, like to shout out Atandra Anwe. She made a very generous pledge. And also, I'm sorry, I don't know this person's name because their screen name is just I don't even. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. <laughs> I know. But shout out to I Don't Even for another very generous pledge. Um, so if you'd like to support the show, um, first of all, you know, just sharing it with your friends, mm-hmm. liking, commenting, leaving us a review on iTunes or whatever app you are using would be very beneficial to us. So if you'd like to support the show without, you know, without giving monetarily you can do that um or you can support us on patreon um which will be in the show notes um or you can make a one-time donation on paypal yay yay or you can do all of those things (laughs) or you can do everything and make us so happy yes (laughs) no but i I do think sharing goes a a sharing episode goes a long way yeah because sharing i feel like that and if a friend is like, hey, check out this awesome podcast. Well, the thing is I live with a podcast on my ears. So mm-hmm. I'm always looking for new stuff to listen to. Mm-hmm. But like mm-hmm. that is my favorite way of discovering new stuff is if I don't have to. Yeah. But also, yeah, also giving us a rating on iTunes and or whatever you're listening to it <laughs> Maxie's on. like, yeah, but also this yeah. is important. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm not saying that's not important. That's very important. But also like doing that it would also be a good way to help people find us even just like you know, searching for a podcast, they could find totally. us. Yeah. Totally. Do we have reviews yet? No. <gasps> what you guys, audience, yeah. please. Maybe, <laughs> maybe we can, we, maybe we can leave a review. To be like, no. I love talking to this yeah, exactly. woman. She's great. <laughs> no, maybe we can visualize people leaving reviews, and then oh, we will leave reviews. That is how we're okay. Okay. Let's set a goal that by next time we record, which is actually in like three days, we'll have a hundred reviews and that will happen. We'll make a vision board. Okay. But you can't think any negative thoughts about it. You can only think that we we, we already have a hundred reviews. Yes. Like no fucking question. We already have a hundred reviews. We already have. We have so many that it's like overloading the server. Me too. Oh my God. (laughs) Who thought we would get to a (laughs) hundred so soon? (laughs) Let's pop the champagne. Yeah. <laughs> Woohoo. Well, you're already popping the wine. Yeah, I know. I'm I'm kinda getting into it. <laughs> it's noon now. Anyway, cool. I feel like we should end this. <laughs> we probably should. We probably should. Anyway, thank you so much to the listeners. Thanks for listening. And good see you in two weeks. Bye. Bye. Bye.